Sure. Good morning, everybody. Crash course in pain biology in seven minutes. So um, our ability to detect uh, harmful stimuli is absolutely essential for our well-being and for our survival. So if you can't detect harmful stimuli, you might boil your fingers in a, in a pot of water. You might tear your ACL during a sports game and not know about it. And importantly, you might have an infection and not be aware of it, and it might kill you. Right? And this is quite exemplified by a condition called congenital insensitivity to pain, where children that are born without the ability to detect uh, painful stimuli often don't survive childhood. They will self-mutilate because they just bite their fingers and don't know they're harming themselves. Right? So that's essential. It's a physiological response that is absolutely critical for a well-being. On the other hand, um, you might have an injury. The injury heals, and yet you're left with a condition of persistent pain and it doesn't go away. And that serves no biological purpose other than it being miserable and uh, often there's very little you can do about it, right? And so we, we try to understand the differences between the two and if you want to have uh, therapeutic uh, strategies towards interfering with chronic pain, you have to separate the two processes. And so the latter is actually exemplified very nicely by this, uh, by this, this self-image, um, a self-portrait from a Mexican artist named Frida Kahlo. So she had a uh, severe uh, accident, a bus accident, that left her uh, with chronic pain for the rest of her life. And she drew, drew this painting, and I just want to point out one thing, as if you can see this here. Uh, her body is pierced with lots of little nails, right? And that's how she felt, and that's how she portrays herself, and it really shows that there is an emotional component to pain, and in fact, pain is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience. So it's real to her, right? Even though the injury may have healed. Now, other examples of uh, these sort of maladaptive processes include uh, a process called me uh, mechanical allodynia that can occur for the nerve injury. So you, you have patients that are hypersensitive to the slightest amount of touch or a light breeze. Uh, they're in severe pain, and it sometimes can't even wear clothing because it just it rubs on their skin and uh, it, it causes a painful response. Another example is cold allodynia during cancer chemotherapy, where patients are very, very sensitive to cold temperatures. This is often transient, but again, you know, it's, it's, it's severely painful. Phantom limb pain, you don't you know, have an amputation, you don't have your limb, but you're in pain and you, you feel your, your, your limb hurting. Or people have a stroke and they destroy uh, specific regions of the brain in the process, and that gives rise to a, a severe perception of pain in limbs and in extremities, even though there is actually no injury, right? And this is very, very hard to treat. So really trying to understand the brain circuits that are responsible for that is, is, is a huge challenge. So how do we detect painful stimuli? And I'm gonna use my laser here on the one side. So uh, we detect stimuli with peripheral nociceptors that are embedded in our skin or in the uh, organ walls. And that leads to the generation of uh, action potentials that travel up an, an afferent nerve all the way to the spinal cord. And this is the first place where complex processing of painful uh, 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 information actually occurs. So the spinal cord is almost like a mini computer that then processes these pain signals, they get transmitted and then passed on to the brain. And this is where we perceive pain as something that is unpleasant, okay? So pain is in the brain, right? At the same time, the pain then sends descending uh, projections back down to the spinal cord that modulates these processes. And all of this together is actually how painful information is detected, transmitted, and then processed. And that leaves multiple points of attack for pharmacological intervention. So for example, opioids will act at the level of the brain and the level of the spinal cord, where they block uh, synaptic transmission. Uh, gabapentinoids, which are neuropathic pain drugs, uh, will also act at the level of synaptic transmission at the spinal cord and regulating the descending modulation of these pain signals. And so you can imagine there's multiple ways of actually interfering with uh, painful stimuli at various points along this um, uh, brain axis. Now, uh, during, uh, after injury, when you have uh, the development of chronic pain, this could occur at, at, at multiple levels. You can have a sensitization of the afferent fibers, so they start to become hypersensitive and start to fire more action potentials than they normally would, right? Or synaptic transmission at the level of the spinal cord could be enhanced permanently, right? So that would uh, lead to an enhanced uh, transmission of, of, of inputs. Uh, spinal cord circuits can get modified um, permanently. 
brain circuits could be dysregulated. So you have suddenly different activity of certain brain connections that give you the perception of having pain even though there is no peripheral stimulus, right? And then you can block everything that you want down here, but you'll still feel pain, right? Um, and then I should just say that some of these processes are sex dependent, right? So there are... Um, uh, conditions or mechanisms that work in male animals uh, when we study them, but they're not the same in female ones, right? And actually understanding this is essential because you want to be able to target your therapies in such a way that everybody benefits. And sometimes there are just genetic reasons uh, by which you can develop chronic pain that has nothing to do with any other dysregulation. So I'll just give you an example here. This is a condition called um, inherited uh, erythromyalgia. And so what happens is these patients uh, suddenly develop severe redness on, the, on their limbs and uh, have excruciating pain, often uh, precipitated by just warm temperatures. And the only way they can deal with it is to put their limb in an ice cold bucket of water to the point where they actually get frostbite, right? And it turns out that this is mediated by a single mutation uh, in a sodium channel that's responsible for the action potentials that, uh, that are generated in, in peripheral nerves, right? And so this, uh, what, what this graph here shows is the probability of a sodium channel opening either under normal conditions or after you have a mutation, right? And you can see there's a leftward shift. So these sodium channels open more and you get more action potentials. And um, there is a drug called carbamazepin, which is known to do exactly the opposite. So if you have that mutation and you get that particular drug, you can reverse the pain phenotype. And to me, this is a fantastic example of precision pain medicine. If you know what the mutation is, you know what the drugs do, and you understand that, you can treat patients in a, in a very, very specific manner. A couple more slides and I'm done. This has uh, been raised earlier. Uh, there are comorbidities between uh, pain and depression. And um, so that when you have chronic pain, uh, many patients become depressed and that feeds back in into increased pain. And I just want to make the point here that there is actually biological reason for that. And so we have some data in our lab that, for example, during visceral inflammation, there is an immune cell infiltration into the brain. These immune cells change brain structures that are known to be responsible for depression. And then you, you, you become depressed, right? So understanding these processes is critical. And we're going to finish just with a, a quick comment about how we actually study pain, right? So in humans, you can ask a, a, a patient, how do you feel? How do you rate your pain on a scale from zero to one? And that's great. But everybody's different. Uh, there are cultural differences in pain scales. And so that makes it very, very difficult to objectively quantify how much pain somebody really has, right? On the flip side, if you're an animal person like myself and works on rats and mice, right? You can't really ask a mouse, how do you feel? So you, you have surrogate measures of that. So you create pain models, you study pain mechanisms, you look at cell biology, and hopefully together, if you look at the whole spectrum, you can come up with uh, uh, new therapies, new ways of understanding pain. So I'll stop right here. Thank you.